Well, good morning, Pine Hills family. I say Auburn Church as well. It is good to be home. This has been a rough year for our family. And as I was talking to my counselor, she said, Joe, what are you doing? <laughs> but when the senior class invited us to come and speak for their baccalaureate, our first thought was, yes, we'd be honored. We'd love to celebrate this occasion with you. But then as time went on, we had some raging emotions coming through, knowing that this would be the first time that we're back in this community since our son died in late September. And so we have asked an army of friends today to pray for us, and we invite you to do the same thing. We're called sometimes to do hard things. This didn't seem like a hard thing to begin with, but it's turned out to be that way because of the emotions, because of the strong feelings that we have here in this community. And because we experience your love over and over again, and we thank you so much for standing beside us during that difficult time and providing this beautiful celebration of life for our son. I'm going to ask that the seniors today, I don't want to talk to you and talk to them. I'm really talking to them today, um, but I don't want to have my back to you. So I'm going to ask seniors, could you guys come and sit down? I'm going to take your answers. We might have another quiz, so just be ready. Okay. <laughs> My counselor said, make sure you have a box of Kleenexes. But I've asked my friends to pray that we won't need to use them, okay? <laughs> Today, we've entitled our presentation, Beauty is in the Eye of the Beholder. It's our desire today, seniors, to examine both the beauty I think you're going to see that a little bit later, and the beholder. And you're also going to hear multiple sayings and cliches. We liked your um, uh, motto, right? Um, what does it say, class? What? No, that's not the motto. That's uh, your aim. What's your motto? Just because it's cliche doesn't mean it's not awesome. We were intrigued by that. We thought, wow, let's explore that. Let's unpack, unpack that. And so we're going to do that a little bit today. You're going to hear some cliches. Some of them you may recognize. Some of them you may not. And then we're also just going to share with you a few sayings that we think are powerful and impactful as well. So, let's begin with Mrs. Freilich. She is going to be talking about this saying, the beauty pageant is rigged. <laughs> Mrs. Freilich, are you ready? Thank you. <laughs> we all want world peace. No. <laughs> that was the question on the test. Not really. The question on the test was, if you were to die today, how sure are you that the next thing you'd see, you'd be resurrected and be in the kingdom? If I were to ask all of you, I wish we could have done that. I wish we could have done a a quiz for the whole congregation to find out what your answer is. And we gave them a scale. Somewhat sure, a little sure, in the middle, very unsure, a little unsure. And so I'm going to be so curious to find out how you ranked because if you didn't answer right, you can't graduate. No, I <laughs> mean. Um, 
Really, though, it's, it's funny that we, we tend to hesitate to have confidence in that question, don't we? Can anybody relate to that? And I think the problem is that we're so aware of our flaws. I would never enter a beauty pageant, ever, right? I'm too aware of my own flaws. We're all aware of our own so much, and especially when it comes to our character. But I want you to remember something. With the saying, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, it's the beholder that matters. Your beauty is in the one who's looking at you. So if I said to you that I don't think I have any chance of winning a beauty contest, what if I said my dad ran beauty pageants when I was a girl? Would that change your thoughts? And in fact, my dad was the only judge of the pageants. Because <laughs> isn't that the way it is with God? He's the one that matters, and he's the one who's judging us. And in fact, he's, he's running this whole show. So when he's looking at us, he sees such incredible beauty. We're guaranteed to win. We've already won. We, wouldn't, we don't even have to dress up. We don't have to give a speech or twirl a baton or do any kind of talent. You've already won before you started because our Heavenly Father is totally biased towards us and our salvation is based on our belonging to Him, not on our behavior. It's a little bit like this thing. Have you ever heard it's hard to cancel a gym membership? <laughs> Anybody ever tried? Well, I want you to think about this. Even before you sweat one drop of sweat, before you extend one muscle fiber, and I know some of you know a little thing or two about that, before you do one thing in that gym, you've got the membership, right? You've got the key fob or whatever it is. You're, you're in, you belong. It's like that with salvation. You've been given that membership. It's about belonging. It's not about your behavior. It's not about what you do once you're in. You're in, you've got it. Another thing, have you ever heard this expression, and maybe you saw it last night with some of the pictures, there's no such thing as an ugly baby? Have you heard that, that saying? Yeah. It's true. When you were born, or the, for those of you that are adopted, when your parents first got you, you were the most beautiful thing they had ever, ever seen, even with the wrinkles and the whatever else. You were so beautiful to them because you're theirs. You belong to them. That's it. You hadn't done a thing for your parents. You may not have done much yet. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Before you do anything, you're just theirs, and they love you so much. It is just the same way with God. It's not based on anything we do for Him, or even anything we don't do for Him, or anything we do wrong. Your parents aren't perfect, but when they're loving you perfectly, it's a uh, an example of how God loves us. You can't mess it up. There's nothing you can do that'll make you love him more or less. We found that to be true as parents. It's based on your belonging, not on your behavior. Just like the verse said in 1 John 3, behold what manner of love the Father's given to us. He calls us his children, and that's what we are. So Mr. Frelick is going to come back out and illustrate our next saying. <laughs> we need the next slide. There it is. God is in pursuit of us. He's going to illustrate the saying from the perspective of a parent with a story about God as the okay. beholder. Yes, yes. Right. Do you know, have you ever heard the story of the prodigal son? I think it should be rewritten and, and a new title. We should be talking about the father, not so much about the son. Because when we look at the father, we see this amazing love. Can you picture it? Here he is on his front porch, looking out every day. He's not saying, I wonder if my son is coming home. He says, my son is coming home. He has faith. He says, my son is coming home. And also, if you look at the preparations for the party afterwards, his stuff was in the pantry. He already had it there. He was waiting for his son to come home 
It's not about so much the Father and his great love. Yes, we're going to talk about that a little bit later. But we want to focus our attention here on the Father and his pursuit for you, his pursuit for me. I want to share with you a story. Maybe you've heard it before. It's a powerful story. And it's about a girl named Christina. Christina grew up in a poor home amongst poverty. She had a pallet for a bed, just to give you an idea. She lived in a um, remote village in Brazil. And she longed to get out of that community. She wanted a better life for herself, which is worthy, right? Something we all want. We all want a better life for ourselves. She had many a conversation with her mom about wanting to leave this little village and go somewhere bigger, like the big city. But her mom said, no, you need to stay. The big city isn't safe for you right now. Wait until you're older. Wait until you have your education. Well, one day, as she was on her way to high school, she had an opportunity. She saw that somebody was traveling to the big city, and she said, I'm going to go. I'm going to go with them. And so she got in their vehicle, and she rode off to the big city. That night, she didn't come home. Her mom knew when she didn't see her for supper that evening that her daughter had gone. And she knew where her daughter had gone, too, right? Her daughter was gone was not home. And so her mom, recognizing what happens when you're beautiful, when you're young, and when you don't have any money, and you're left alone on the streets of a large city, some pretty bad stuff can happen. And so she took everything that she had, everything, she sold some things, she gathered all the money that she could muster up, and she bought a bus ticket. After she bought the bus ticket, she said, I have one more purchase to make. She ran to a drugstore across the street, went inside, sat down at the photo booth, closed the curtain, and took as many photos as she could afford. She stuffed them in her purse, and she went out and got on that bus. When she arrived in the big city, Rio de Janeiro, she said, where could my daughter be? She went to every bar. She went to every nightclub. She went to every hotel. And in those places, she taped or tacked on one of those small little pictures of herself. She had typed, or she had written, rather, on the back of each picture, a personal message. But her money ran out. Her, her pictures ran out. And she had to go home without her daughter. Several weeks later, Christina, her daughter, came down the steps of a hotel. And as she came into the lobby, she saw she recognized a face. She went over to the mirror, and there she saw a picture of her mom. She couldn't believe it. How did her mom know she was going to be here? She read the back of it, and this is the invitation that was written on the back. Wherever you are, whatever you've done, you know I love you greatly. Please come home. Never forget, class of 2024, that God is in constant pursuit of you. He is going to go with you wherever you go. He's not going to force himself on you. That's not who he is, but he's there. If ever you need him, he's right there beside you. And we've discovered that this year. We've had a rough year, and we have found God to be very faithful, a God who stands beside us, a God who gives us courage and strength to face big things, challenging things in our lives. And I know that he's going to do that for each one of us. And now, Mrs. Frelick is going to look at, we're going to take a look at the next slide. It says, 
outer beauty attracts, this is a cliche, outer beauty attracts, inner beauty captivates. I have to take these off because I can't see with them. <laughs> this is essentially how I looked when I met that man. And I know he looks like a Ken doll right now. <laughs> That's not how he looked when I met him. But this is basically how I looked. Khaki, skirt, knee socks, a free t-shirt I got my freshman year at college. And yeah, my hair was actually pretty close to this, believe it or not. It was a combination of a lack of finances, a lack of knowledge, and a lack of motivation to really invest in my appearance. <laughs> I was 17 years old, yeah, young freshman, and he was 23. He was an old junior. He had taken two years out to be a student missionary, so there was quite an age gap. But that wasn't the real problem. See, if we had been on dating apps, he would have swiped me which way, which way, to, anyway, you know. <laughs> he would have swiped the wrong way. <laughs> but I, I want you to picture him a number of decades ago. And um, let me just say, if I had been on a dating app, not only would I have swiped the right way, I would have taken a screenshot. <laughs> so uh, anyway, that gives you an idea. That actually wasn't the real problem, though. The real problem was he had uh, just broken up with this other girl, woman, actually. He was in love with her still. They'd been in a serious relationship, so I was not anywhere close to being on his mind in that way. Nevertheless, we had quite similar interests. And before we knew it, within the first week of school, we were, um, we ended up in, as leaders, co-leaders of this children's ministry that met every weekend in college. And we found out we were really, really compatible. Our talents were compatible and our personalities. We became very fast friends and spent so much time together, working together, praying together, goofing off with our friends together, confiding in one another. It didn't take long before I was crushing on him, big time. So knowing that he loved someone else, I did the smartest thing I could think of a couple months into the year. I friend-zoned myself. If you want to know more, I'll tell you later. It worked really well. So anyway, by the end of the year, because we had worked so well, he said, you know what? It's going to be my senior year. I'm going to be running for social vice president, but I'm going to be student teaching, and I can't handle all that. Could you be my assistant? So I said, sure. So now we were doing this children's ministry together, and we were co-social vice on campus, which, if you don't know, there were one or two social events every week at this school. So we were spending so, so, so much time together. At the end of the year, I was planning to go as a student missionary to the same country where he had gone, and he was graduating from college, and he said, hey, we're going to be in the islands at the same time. And then a little while later, he said, hey, I found out we're going to be at the same school on the same island. Isn't that great news? Nope. I said, if I spend one more year with you, I actually said this to him, if I spend one more year with you, I'm going to fall so in love with you, I'm gonna break, my heart will be broken. Silence. <laughs> Silence. Now, at this point, he and the other girl had not worked it out, but he hadn't made any moves on this. <laughs> so I'd given up on him. We were just going to be friends. So we spent a third year together on this little island in Micronesia. And uh, after the end of that year, um, I went back to school, and he stayed for a second year because he had already graduated, so you have to make a two-year commitment. So we had a year apart. Now, back then, there were no communication options except phone calls and letters. And phone calls were expensive. We were both broke. And letters um, would have been great, but we both really stink at writing letters. So we basically, I think I wrote him once, and he wrote me once that whole year, even though we were such close friends. So anyway, the end of that year, he comes back after being a year apart. I'm 21. I learned how to put on makeup. <laughs> I learned how to do my hair. It was all up. It was a wedding weekend for one of our friends. I had my hair up, new dress. And that was actually, he confesses, the first time he ever noticed how attractive I was. 
took him four years. <laughs> okay, we'll go easy on him. So then I had to finish school, and he found a teaching job, and so we had another year where we were just friends, long distance. Every Friday night, he'd call, and I'd go running to my dorm room after Vespers when I'd hear the phone ringing and chat with him and found out later I wasn't the only girl he was calling on Friday nights. <laughs> he was keeping his options open. But anyway, I'm divulging way too much. I can hear him cough back there, so. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I don't know if he said amen or hey. Long story short, uh, our sixth year of knowing each other, he helped me get a job in the same state, finally. We were two hours apart, and we had some long-distance dating. And after six years of very, very close friendship, we got married. So even now, when Mr. Felix says to me, I love you, you know what I say a lot of times? I loved you first. <laughs> now, I have to tell you, as we've gotten older, you guys know, inner beauty fades anyway. But outer beauty actually can grow. I said that backwards. <laughs> For some couples, their inner beauty apparently fades. <laughs> and outer beauty, hopefully, get no, okay. <laughs> um. Usually, outer beauty fades, but your inner beauty is meant to grow, right? Okay. And we have found that to be true because, you know, as his character improves and grows, it makes me want to be like that. It makes me want to be more patient, more loving, more whatever. It's, it's a back and forth beautiful thing. We call that in the Christian walk, sanctification, right? And so often, or our youth pastor calls it liberation freedom from the, the character flaws you have in your heart and mind. Um, so often we get that mixed up with salvation. You've got to draw a distinction between the two. Because just because I may be not seeing his inner or outer beauty or him mine at the moment, does that mean we're not married? No. We, we, we belong to each other ever since 1996. That's a long time. I'm his, he's mine. It doesn't matter in the moment what our behavior is. We belong to one another. So don't hesitate to have assurance of your salvation just because you focus at the moment on what you wish God would change in your life. The reality is you have to remember we're not the ones whose character is really being judged on this planet. God's the one on trial. And... Satan has been working to defame his character since he first accused him of being unjust and untrue. Have you heard the saying, all the world's a stage? It's really true, guys. We're on a stage. In a way, it's like this world is a courtroom. The thing is, we're not on trial. It's not our character at stake. It's God's. We do have the chance to be witnesses for him, though. We're not the defendant, though. Don't forget that. By beholding, we, come, we become changed. You've heard that before? It comes from 2 Corinthians 18. We can see and reflect the glory of the Lord, and the Lord who is spirit makes us more and more like him as we're changed into his glorious image. That is hard to change to be like a God that's really hard to connect with when he's so far away. But think about what you do with long-distance relationships. It is possible to communicate. It is possible to grow close enough to one another that you decide, that's what I want for life. Our next saying is, oh, just remember, if you spend time getting to know God's character, his inner beauty, really, because you can't see him, you'll be captivated and will love him more and more deeply. Our next saying is, Salvation is a free gift. Mr. Frelick is going to illustrate this thing from a perspective of a friend with a story about us as the beholder. Hey, guys. Hey, guys. The stage coach is coming. The new teacher. He's just arrived. Oh, Mr. Primble, the new frontier teacher in this small little town had just arrived, and it was his first day of class. 
Mr. Primble said, guess what? I don't make any rules in my classroom. Oh, what? No rules? Oh, they were kind of excited. But he said, you know, like any game, if you don't have any rules, it's not much fun, right? If I'm playing kickball, and you say I'm out, and I say, no, there are no rules, I'm not out. And you throw another ball at me, and I kick it, and you catch it, and they say, you're out. And I say, no, I'm not out. We don't have any rules in the game. Is it fun? No, it gets old really quick, and you want to quit. So Mr. Pribble knew that, and so he said, you know, I don't make the rules in my classroom. My students make the rules. Oh, we get to make the rules? They were pretty excited about that. And so he said, yeah, um, what kind of rules should we have this year? A little girl in the front row raised her hand and said, no spitting on the floor. Oh, Mr. Pribble said, yeah, that's pretty important. You guys agree? You, you want people to spit on the floor? No. Okay. He wrote it on the board. Another person said, uh, uh, no coming to school late. Oh, Mr. Primble liked that, right? So he said, what do you think, class? Do you think we all, it's okay to come late? They all said, no, we should come on time. Mr. Primble loved that. He wrote it on the board. Another student said, um, no stealing. Oh, Mr. Primble said, that's a good thing. You guys agree with that? Yeah, yep, yeah, wrote it on the board. Then Mr. Primble went on to say, you know, we got all these rules, and in fact, there were so many more rules than Mr. Primble would have ever made by himself. It was full, his chalkboard was full of rules, and he said, now, let's go through each one of those rules, and let's develop a consequence, a fair consequence, if somebody breaks each one of those rules. So they went to the first one, no spitting on the floor. The same little girl raised her hand and said, I think they should have to clean it up. Oh, that's a good idea. And she said, and they need to clean up the whole floor. Oh, okay. Next rule, which was, help me out. Oh, you need to be on time. Thank you. You were listening. Somebody was listening. You need to be on time. Um, he said, well, what happens, Mr. Pimble, would you be okay if we we're 10 minutes late? Then we have to stay 10 minutes afterwards to make up our time? Mr. Primble said, I'd be willing to do that. And so, then they went to no stealing. Somebody in the room said, 15 lashes across the bare back with a belt. Oh, getting a little tough here, said Mr. Primble. But he knew this was a frontier town. There weren't a lot of stores. If somebody stole something that was yours, um, things were pretty precious. You get it? So he said, Everybody agreed, yep, that's what we want to do. Well, you know, two months, went, two months went by, no problems at all. This class had had a history of driving the teacher away, right? But these students were getting along well, and they were abiding by all, the, all of the rules until one day, Big John comes running in the classroom and says, Mr. Primble, Mr. Primble, somebody stole my lunch. Big John said, Oh, Big John, calm down, calm down. I'm sure you must have misplaced it someplace. No, no, I put it in the foyer right next to my coat. It's not there anymore. Oh, well, anybody know about the lunch, guys? Everybody was silent. Um, okay, guys, we're going to try something else. Mr. Primble said everybody put their head down on their desk. <laughs> and if you know anything about this lunch, missing lunch, raise your hand, and I'll come and talk with you privately. He tried that. Not one hand went up. Can you imagine that? Hmm. Finally, Mr. Primble, after several minutes, heard a little boy crying in the classroom. Mr. Primble went over to him and he said, Timmy, what's wrong? He said, I, 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 I ate it. Mr. Primble, no, he said, I took it. I'm sorry. <laughs> and then he said, well, yeah, and I ate it too. He said, you know, we've had it really rough on our farm. My dad died a couple of months ago. It's just been our, the, my mom and us kids. And yesterday we ran out of food. We had nothing left. I hadn't, didn't have any supper. I didn't have any breakfast. When I walked by that big lunch, I thought, oh, I'll just look at it. I'll just smell it. And then the smell turned into eating one sandwich, eating two sandwiches, until he consumed the whole lunch. Well, Mr. Brimble said, looked at the chart, 
looked at the rules on the wall, and he said, okay, Timmy. He hated to do it. It was against everything within him. But he knew if he didn't abide by those rules and the consequences that they had decided as a class, things weren't going to work out very well for the rest of the year. It was his fear. And so he said, Timmy, come up. Little Timmy came up, took off his coat. Mr. Primble said, take off your shirt. And as he took off his shirt, everyone saw just skin and bones. Little Timmy, he said, I want you to put one arm on this side of my desk and bend over it, and this side on the other, this arm on the other. And then he took out his belt, and he began to bring it down for the first whack. And he heard a voice. It was Big John again. He said, Mr. Primble, stop. He said, uh, would it be OK for somebody else to take another person's punishment? Uh, well, we never talked about that class. What do you think? Everybody was in agreement. Yeah, it would be OK. And so Big John said, I'd like to take little Timmy's punishment. Can you imagine that? The boy lunch, whose lunch he ate is willing to come and take his punishment for him. He comes up to the desk, takes off his shirt, big, strong, muscular. He gets behind Timmy. He bends over. He grabs one of Timmy's hands in this, with his hand and the other hand like this. And he said, Mr. Primble, let me have it. Mr. Primble took his belt. One, two, three, four. Ooh, the kids in the class began to see these red marks all along Big John's back. Five, six, seven, eight, nine. Now there were welts building and little beads of blood oozing out of the corners. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Finally, Big John's back was completely bloody. Blood dripping down his back, blood falling on the floor. And somehow or other, I think little Timmy didn't understand what had been taking place. But finally, things began to register with him. And as he stood up from the desk, he looked at Big John and he said, Big John, I'm going to love you forever. When we see what God has done for us, right? When we take it in, and we understand the magnitude of his love. And we see it, and we experience it. It can't help but stir within us that same kind of a response. God, I'm going to love you forever. Post-test. Mr. Felix is going to give you one more quiz. So you can leave the slide up that says salvation is a free gift if you want. I want to talk about one last cliche. Have you ever heard um, the phrase, a priceless work of art? Have you heard that? Yeah. Here's the definition for priceless. Having a value beyond all price, some synonyms, invaluable, incomparable, costly, precious, irreplaceable. Think about artwork. The first reason it might be valuable is because of who made it, right? If you have even just a sketch from someone really famous like Raphael or Leonardo da Vinci, it, it's worth a lot, right? So who made us in, determines our value in a big part. Secondly, our worth is determined, just like artwork, by the price someone's willing to pay for it. If someone's willing to pay millions of dollars for a piece of artwork, it's worth a million dollars. How long has it been since you thought about the price paid for you? So when I think about that, I say, wow. The last eight, nine months, 
Mr. Freilich and I have been thinking a lot about the price that was paid for us. I had most of you in junior high, and I don't know if you ever remember me saying this, but I used to, when I talked about how much God loves us, I remember saying, you know, I might be willing, I love you guys, I might be willing to jump in front of a train to save your life. I might. I'd like to think I would. But I said back then, I know for sure I wouldn't put one of my own children in front of the train to save you. Sorry, guys. Do you kind of remember me ever saying that? Man, has that taken on new meaning here. After losing Justin at 20 years old, so young, irreplaceable. Yeah, he's irreplaceable in our lives. Priceless. I can tell you for sure I couldn't give up him or any one of my children for someone else. What kind of love God has that he gave up his son for us? And what kind of love that Christ willingly laid down his life? He said, greater love has no one than to give up your life for your friends. He considers us his friends, like Big John, little Timmy. God can bring beauty from ashes, and we've experienced that in these last months. One of the beautiful things we've been able to see is that God loves us so much. We can comprehend it better from the loss of our own child. So I want to just pass that message on to you so deeply today, guys, that you'll leave Pine Hills, and no matter what happens in your future, whatever highs or lows you're going to experience in life, you won't forget. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. God sees tremendous beauty in us. Look at what he's done for us. We can have assurance of our salvation. And the beauty that he sees in us, remember, is based on our belonging to him. It's not based on our behavior. Our part is just to believe it. That expression, salvation is a free gift, I actually disagree with that. Salvation is an expensive gift. There was a high price paid for each one of us, but it's given to us freely. In turn, not only does God see incredible beauty in us, but don't forget we can grow to see beauty in God, just like Mr. Freilich grew to see incredible beauty in me. Truth is, he saw the inner beauty right away. When we grasp how greatly God loves us and what he's done for us, it makes him want to love him and to know him better. And by beholding him, we can become changed to be more like him. Think about this. Time together reveals the treasure. Time together reveals the treasure. That's true for people. It's also true for God. Our part is to take the time. So how do you do that? We want to end with an application. And hopefully Mr. Freilich will be cha finishing changing really fast because he's supposed to be out here by now joining me for this part. But <laughs> So some practical ideas. Um, talk to your parents. Talk to friends. Talk to other Christians and find out how have they grown closer to God because the reality is we are in a long-distance relationship with an invisible God. There he is. It's not easy to get to know him. So here are some practical ideas we have found to be very helpful in our lives. Can I share some? Ask God to wake you up in the morning. Grab, want to grab a microphone? Ask God to wake you up in the morning. He's faithful. He'll do it. Um, I remember when we were in third and fourth grade, I talked about that. Some of you tried it, and you found out that it worked. And God wants to spend time with us. He loves it, right? Any time that you're able to give him. And if it means waking up a few minutes earlier so that can happen, make it happen, right? Do you want to collect the quizzes? Oh, you already did. Okay. Another, um, another idea is use apps on your phone. There's so many. Our favorite one we found recently is called YouVersion, a Bible app. It's really great. Um, Another idea is from a book we read about connecting to something in your life. You want to talk about that? 
Yeah, the author of the book said, you know, pick something that you do frequently throughout the day, <laughs> like maybe drink water, right? We do that pretty frequently. And then every time you drink water, um, you think about God, and you have a thought about Him. You pray and ask Him to just be a part of your day, you know? So just something practical. It doesn't have to be that. It could be something else, you know, but something that you do frequently, and it just gets, keeps your mind focused on God throughout your day. And the last one is choose friends who also have the goal of becoming closer to God. That makes a huge difference. Um, we found that to be true in our own lives, and so will you. It's kind of like if you want to be healthy, find the healthiest, healthiest nut you can and make friends with them, and pretty soon you'll be eating cornflakes too, or I don't know. Thank you, guys. Don't forget, by beholding, we become changed because beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Please bow your heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the wonderful message from the Freilix. As we leave today, help us to carry out what we learned in our everyday lives and to have a good rest of our Sabbath. In Jesus' name, amen.